Moderators, the Blakely, ladies and gentlemen, I'm before you the, for the final speech of the evening, and I hope that it'll pass rapidly and pleasantly for you. I'd like to express my appreciation for your marvelous uh, interest and attention, and the fine spirit that has characterized the debate throughout. I could not ask for uh, finer conduct on the part of uh, both the audience and our opponents in this discussion. And I hope that in the summation and brief discussion of matters remaining, uh, that it may be edifying for you. Now, uh, first of all, uh, he uh, discussed in some uh, detail um, uh, the matter of anointing and sealing and the earnest. I'm going to get to that in just a moment. But before I do, I want to deal with one matter that he mentioned in which he sort of uh, uh, ridiculed the idea that we cannot know. He said, you can know. Well, of course, he's wrong on that. And, but then uh, it happens that his um, uh, beloved and, and uh, venerable father, whom I'm delighted to have in the audience and who is truly a marvelous writer and whose uh, paper I enjoy, uh, happens to be on my side of that uh, question. I have here the banner of truth on page 9 of the issue for June 1985. We have this statement. Since the Holy Spirit, being spirit, is in, impalpable or indiscernible by the physical senses, it requires faith and spiritual perception to realize his presence. Well, I believe that. That's a good statement. That's exactly right. That says you can't discern it by the senses. That's what I said. That's what Brother Fred and I believe. Now, I hope that Brother Fred will get you off and teach you more accurately or more perfectly the way, the way of the Lord. So, um, then he cites us to um, statement in Ezekiel chapters 36 and 37, or at least uh, bleakly refers to that, about the Lord putting the Spirit in them. This doesn't say anything about it being the Holy Spirit. It was actually... Uh, uh, spirit of obedience and it had reference to a restoration of uh, the Jews and it has reference to the same event as the stirring of the dry bones in the valley it has absolutely nothing to do with the question of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit then he said that I had one passage mission, uh, missing from the chart on the reception of the Spirit now I didn't I'm well aware of Romans 8 and 15 but I would call his attention to the fact that there it's the spirit of adoption. This has no reference to the Holy Spirit there. Uh, the Apostle Paul was very careful in his, uh, by the dictates of the Holy Spirit, of uh, using the article when it refers to the Spirit in person, and then to an influence of uh, personality, he leaves that off. And it happens that there isn't any article in the Greek text before the word spirit in that passage. And the contrast there is between the spirit of bondage and the spirit of adoption. And this is a disposition and not the Holy Spirit, and so he misses the point completely on that passage, and it has no relevance, and therefore I left it off of the uh, list because it has no relevance to it. Now, uh, as to his statement on paper, where is that statement there? Uh, uh, he was supposed to put a passage up there. But he didn't do it, you notice, and this, the reason is obvious, there is no such passage. Had there been such, he would have put it up here in the outset of the debate. Let it go down now on the record that our friend Blakely made a desperate effort to prove his point and couldn't find one passage, not one, that said that the Spirit dwells in us literally, bodily, personally, actually. Just not there. Therefore, his proposition fails. Now, <clears throat> this um, covers his speech. I do want to discuss in detail that, um, uh, let me see here, this chart here, the matter of the anointing. I, I'm glad that it came up because this is uh, very pertinent to this discussion. Let's have chart 19 because this deals with the passages and the argument that he made on the uh, seal and the earnest. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.22. Um, uh, 2 Corinthians 1.22 and 5.5 5 and Ephesians 1.14. Now here is the statement in 2 Corinthians 1.21 and 22. Now he that establisheth us with you in Christ and anointeth us is God who also sealed us 
and gave us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. In John chapter 2 and verse 20 we have, And ye have an anointing from the Holy One, and ye know all things. His anointing teacheth you concerning all things. Verse 27. So you see, first of all, the anointing in 2 Corinthians 1, 21 has reference to the miraculous manifestation of the Spirit upon uh, the people of that day. And since that age terminated, or that practice terminated with the age of the apostles, then it's out of order to talk about an anointing being applicable to us today. It simply is not. It was a miraculous gift that was limited to that day. The word seal has an interesting history. It's not a seal in the sense that you fasten up something so you can't get in it. The type of seal that's contemplated here is a mark or a stamp. In olden times, it was usually the king's ring that he mashed into a soft, waxy substance that, sanct that sanctified the thing and designated it as being uh, of his approval. And so, that's the type of seal that's contemplated here. Christians are sealed, and we have that seal. Now, we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. And the word earnest conveys the notion of a part payment. A down payment. Now, the effort on the part of uh, our friend uh, Blakely is to make that uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Well, in the first place, if that were it, since the earnest means the full payment later, all he's promising there is that you'll just receive more of the Spirit in heaven than you have here. This detracts from all of the other blessings there. Of course, he's dead wrong on that, as he has been on many other matters. The earnest and the part payment we have is the joy and the marvelous blessing of Christianity here, which is simply a foretaste of the magnificent blessings beyond human apprehension that awaits us in the by and by. I'd call his attention for further study on that, that the word earnest necessitates the conclusion that it has reference to payment in exact kind. Now, this is the significance of the Greek word. It can't be simply a promise of some sort of future payment, but it's a future payment of the same kind. And if it refers to the Holy Spirit, then it detracts from all of the other joys that will be characteristic of the Christian in the sweet by and by. So, we've taken every argument that he's made and examined it and shown that it does, that it does not teach a literal bodily personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We've also shown that we believe in the indwelling of the Spirit, just like we believe in the indwelling of God and of Christ. They're all in us, but they're in us as their wills control and dominate. There's no deity that's come down into human bodies today like Christ came down into a human body. If that were so, we'd be objects of worship one by another. Of course that's not correct. And yet, the Spirit is with us as Christ is with us, as God is with us. Their lives influence ours, and that's the sense in which the book teaches it. Now, on that point, let me uh, just discuss, as he indicated a while ago, about the matter of the, of the word receive. That the New Testament teaches that the mere fact that a person believed in repentant and was baptized did not necessarily mean that he would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It followed belief and baptism in cases back then, but not necessarily so. Now let me give you a clear-cut example, which I've already alluded to in, in the former speech. In Acts 8 and verse 4, we're, say, we're told that the disciples were scattered abroad and went everywhere preaching the word. It is said in Acts 8 and 5 that Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. In verse 12, it specified what the preaching was and the results. When they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So they heard, believed, and were baptized. The Lord said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Hence they were saved. But at that point, they had not received the Holy Spirit. For now watch, at verse 15, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of the Lord, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they came down, prayed for them, that they might receive 
the Holy Spirit. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them. Only they had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. What that says is simply this. They had heard, believed, and obeyed and were saved. But they had not yet received the Holy Spirit. Oh, somebody might say, but that well, that only means they'd not receive the miraculous measure. They'd receive the ordinary measure. Well, if they had, then they'd receive the Spirit. But the text says they hadn't. Now, what is correct? The Bible says they had not received it under the apostles' laid hands on. How then did they receive it? Through the laying on of the apostles' hand. Take another case alluded to earlier. In Acts 19, when Paul reached Ephesus, he found certain disciples there, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? That's synecdoche key for saved. Any time that you find the word believe and condition on it blessings, it's always comprehensive, and it's under the figure of the synecdoche key. That's the same thing as saying, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you were saved? Now that had been unnecessary if it follows automatically that when one is baptized, he receives the Holy Spirit. Paul would have simply said, well, are you saved? He would have known that they'd had the Holy Spirit. But he here clearly indicates they could have been saved and not have had the Holy Spirit. Well, they said, we never have heard of, or well, hadn't heard the Holy Spirit was given. Well, he saw then that there was something defective about their uh, baptism because they couldn't have been baptized without being baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, scripturally. So he said then, into what were you baptized? Seeing that this was the point where the defect was. And they said unto John's baptism. He explained the nature of John's baptism, and then baptized them in the name of the Lord, that is, by the Lord's command and by his authority, and then laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. In every instance, friends, where an apostle was present, apparently they laid hands on people. The Corinthians had so many uh, miraculous gifts that they were envious and jealous of each other on that. Now, uh, keep me informed about the time and let me know when I have about five minutes. I've got eight. All right, that'll give me time to discuss one other matter that was introduced. And that's this. What about Romans 8 and 26? The Spirit helpeth our infirmity, for we know not what to pray for as we ought. And the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. He asked about the intercession earlier, and I mentioned this as an incident of the Holy Spirit's intercession. It has in it three movements or propositions. Number one, the Spirit helpeth our infirmity. Number two, we know not what to pray for as we ought. Number three, the Spirit uh, maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now let's study it very carefully. Number one, the Spirit helpeth our infirmity. The word infirmity means weakness. So that tells us that the Spirit helps us when we're weak. Interestingly, the word help there translates a Greek word that occurs but one other time in all the Greek Testament. Now the idea of aid, our assistance, frequently appears. But not this word in its other instance. is in the story of Mary and Martha particularly. And Martha's request to Jesus that he would have Mary to help her. And the literal significance of that Greek verb is of one who stands on the other side and asks assistance. It's not outside the realm of probability that when Martha made that request, that she was a hold of a heavy title or some other object and wanted Jesus to tell Mary to get a hold on the other side and help. Figuratively used here, of course, it represents the Holy Spirit standing on the other side of our difficulty and lifting with us. He doesn't do all the lifting. He doesn't leave it to us to do all. He lifts with us. So the Spirit helps us. Helps us when we're weak. Helps us when we do not know what to pray for as we ought. How painfully conscious surely all of us are of that fact when the troubles of the world are on our shoulders. When clouds ominous and heavy appear on the horizon. When obstacles that at the moment seem insurmountable are in our path. Bewildered, confused, agitated, often incoherent, unable even to put in word our need. That's often the case when our needs are greatest. So this tells us that the Spirit helps us. Helps us when we do not know what to ask for. Helps us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Who? The Spirit. What Spirit? The Holy Spirit does what? Helps us. Helps us when? When we're weak, particularly when? When we know not what to pray for as we are. How does He do it? 
with groanings which cannot be uttered. Whose groanings? Denominational theologians, without exception and to my dismay lately some brethren, say that the groanings there are the groanings of the Spirit which I repudiate and reject without hesitation. I can't conceive of anybody groaning unless in pain or unless unable to express them clear, uh, themselves clearly. I can't conceive of the Spirit being in either category. I repudiate that explanation. Well, if not the Spirit, then who is it? Obviously, the person who doesn't know what to pray for is ill. That is, when the burdens of life are upon us and difficulties insurmountable in our way. We can only groan in spirit and say, Lord, Lord, even then, our prayers do not fall upon deaf ears. Because this passage teaches us that the Holy Spirit picks up these groanings and interprets them to our Heavenly Father in terms of our need. But I would submit to you, friends, that that's an influence that's wrought not upon man, but upon God. That's an action that takes place not on earth, but in heaven. You watch how the context corroborates that and keep me informed on the time here. And the next verse, the 27th reads, For he that searcheth the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, for he that is the Spirit makes intercession for the saints. Now distinguish, please, between mediation and intercession. Only Christ can mediate. But to intercede is simply to play in behalf of another. And this the Holy Spirit does in our behalf before the Father. That is, the Father sees in the mind of the Spirit, so Paul affirms our need because he acts as an intercessor there. I think that this illustration will indicate it. A is hopelessly bankrupt, completely insolvent, broke, if you please. B has the money to loan, but he won't let A have it on A's unsupported word. C comes along and stands good for A. And B, on the strength of C's name, lets A have the money. A would represent man, Marlin, spiritual bankrupt. B would represent God, against whom man is signed, and who is under no obligation to hear his prayer. C would represent Christ, who stands good for man, and God, on the strength of Christ's name, hears and answers man's prayer. Now back to the illustration one moment. A, A, in borrowing money from B, on C's name, doesn't know how to fix up the note. So he calls in the help of D. that helps him fix up the note. D then represents the Holy Spirit that helps us with the note. But that helping is in heaven, not on earth. And it's an influence that's wrought on the mind of God and not on man. That, friends, is what this passage teaches. And we've shown you conclusively that the Holy Spirit inaugurates, carries through, and consummates every act of conversion. When on that memorable Pentecost day, the Holy Spirit came in vitalizing power and the church of our Lord sprang into existence, on that day, for the first time in the name of the risen Lord, men obeyed the gospel and became children of his. And henceforth, to enjoy the blessings and benefits, characteristic of followers of the Lord, faithful sons of his, and with a glorious expectation of a happy and marvelous home in the by and by. Has it ever occurred to you how little we preach with reference to that state? And the reason is because we have so little capacity here to visualize what it must be like on Golden Shores. But I can assure you that whatever it is, it will be beyond our fondest imagination and our wildest dreams. And I urge you to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit as it's set out upon the sacred page of the Word. Be obedient to His precepts because it's only thus that you will enjoy His approbation here and ultimately salvation, eternal bliss in that land of unclouded day. We're all rapid passages from time to eternity. We're beating a rapid march to the eternal shore. One day soon, it'll be very soon for some, it can't be long for any. The joys of earth will fade, and life will be at an end, and we'll launch out into the fathomless depths of the great beyond. When that hour comes, I hope that we will have all ordered our affairs and arranged our lives 
so as to be among those approved. We'll do it only if we've been obedient to his commands. I thank you. Thank you, Brother Woods, Brother Blakely. The Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians because they searched the scriptures daily to see whether these things be so. And we, we trust that this will be, this will characterize the people that are in this audience tonight. And we want to extend a special uh, uh, thanksgiving and uh, appreciation for uh, both uh, Brother Woods and Brother Blakely and the labors that were expended in uh, preparing and coming to this debate. And also uh, for you, uh, the audience, uh, have been a very uh, attentive and uh, wonderful audience uh, to both of the speakers. We thank you for this. And, and then uh, especially we would thank uh, Brother Price and the brethren here in Marlowe. Uh, you have been very uh, uh, courteous and uh, gracious uh, to us. Uh, I say this in the behalf of Brother Blakely and our small company that have come down from Northwest Indiana. Uh, we just want to thank you for this, for the uh, extensive planning and uh, preparation and the wide uh, publicizing of the debate. We, we just are uh, deeply uh, uh, indebted to you for this. And uh, before we close tonight, uh, Brother Price uh, is going to come up to the podium and give you some information about uh, tapes, uh, the availability of tapes. And then after this, I'm going to ask uh, Brother Dean Bolt to come up and offer our closing prayer. I certainly want to join with Al and both of the uh, debaters in saying that we are very appreciative of the kind kindness on the part of each of these uh, men as well as the great attitude expressed by all of you as part of this audience. You've been a very fine audience, well behaved audience and that because of that we can derive a lot from this particular study. We have visitors from many, many places. I talked to one today from California. I understand some from Arizona. I know we have some Kansas and Missouri. I know we have some from uh, Houston. We have had uh, inquiries literally from uh, Wyoming to Texas, from South Carolina to California and Oregon, uh, you name it. We've had them almost from uh, say half of the states and that's great. One thing that I I've really come to appreciate too is this fact that some of you have driven so far and spent, I know, quite a, a deal of money that you might be here for this particular occasion. I know that you feel like that it's uh, well worth what it have, has cost you to come. But you know, I also realize that it's only because of uh, this kind of a study in depth uh, with both probing the uh, statements made by the other it's only by that that even a greater cre uh, creation of an appetite has uh, been aroused, an appetite for thirsting for the knowledge of God. I, I dare say that the effects of this debate are not going to end when we leave this auditorium tonight. But many of you are going to get tapes, and you're going to go home, and you're going to study those tapes and look over those passages, and there's where a lot of the real deep Bible study is going to be occurring. And I hope that's the purpose that uh, each of you have to learn more as you hunger and thirst after the words of righteousness. Regarding tapes, uh, this has been taped uh, on video as well as audio. I noticed that uh, Brother Joe McDonald has uh, done this in both VHS and beta. And if you'd like to have a copy of this, and the quality is excellent, I walked in while some of the taping was being done in his little uh, workshop trailer and the uh, picture is beautiful and the, and the voice is fine. Same thing is true regard to the audio tapes that are made by Thomas Gardner. The addresses of these men are on the tables out in the front. And please m be uh, sure that you do take their addresses. If you want to have these you can probably sign some of the papers tonight certainly go home and then write to these men and they'll be glad to mail those to you. Our Bible study is really not over yet. Uh, Brother Guy Woods is going to be with us tomorrow in our 
uh, Bible class and as well as preach for us at the morning worship assembly, 301 North Broadway here at the Church of Christ. And if you're visiting with us, plan on staying over. We're certainly glad to have you on both of those instances for deeper study of the Word of God. We appreciate him, appreciate the fact that given and, and those that have come with him are willing to come so far. That's not done if they didn't care and if they were not men of conviction. We appreciate them for that. Now, we'll have our closing prayer. I would just like to <clears throat> extend my hand to Brother Blakely as an indication of the fact that we are friends and that there's absolutely no tension or antagonism and that we uh, have had a high-tone debate and I'm sure that he agrees.